My name's Raleigh from Kennedy Bunk. What's the spookiest weather you've ever seen? Ooh, spookiest weather, Raleigh. I had to give this one some thought because, of course, fog quickly does come to mind. But when I think back on spooky weather, I've got to talk about these green thunderstorms. Sometimes you might know what I'm talking about. I mean, in the summertime, before that storm hits, the, out, the outdoor air kind of turns green, the clouds turn green, and people have said, what is going on with that? I think that's pretty spooky stuff. So here's what's happening with that. Now, when a thunderstorm develops late in the afternoon, naturally there's a lot of reds and oranges in the atmosphere. And if there's enough moisture in the storm system and we get hail, that can lead to some blue in the storm. Well, you put the blue and the red together and you've got that green. The takeaway here is if you ever do see a thunderstorm that's turning green, know that it's a visual warning that the thunderstorm is capable of producing very large hail. And that in itself can be quite scary. John, Kathleen? Uh, certainly mm. can. Okay, Roger, thank you so much. Well, now to this, from the deep, dark woods to Maine's foggy coastline to, of course, the enduring legacy of Stephen King. Maine can definitely have a, a creepy atmosphere, especially this time of year. So tonight, we're sharing some spots around our state that many visitors say they truly believe are haunted. So let's get the obvious out of the way right here and start in Bangor. The Mount Hope Cemetery, the second oldest garden cemetery in the country. Visitors have reported seeing apparitions lurking among the old gravestones. The classic horror movie, of course, Pet Cemetery, was filmed there as well. Very scary. In York, this grave from the 17th century has a special tenant, a witch. Mary Nassen was accused by York residents of being a witch, so they had to place that giant slab over her grave in an attempt to keep her from rising from the dead. Mm. These types of stones were common back then as a way to keep animals away, but still, the witchy legends persist. And legend has it that the 19th century opera house in Booth Bay Harbor has a ghost named Fingers haunting the building. It seems he likes music, like the Phantom of the Opera. People have claimed to hear an old piano playing on its own. Oh, that's eerie. Finally, this one most of us know. The 150-year-old Fort Knox has so much paranormal lore attached to it. Enthusiasts lead ghost tours there late at night sometimes while camping inside the grounds if you dare. And it is believed that the spirit of a man who died while working on the fort still lingers to this day. They also do a great haunted house this time of year. Uh, I'm too chicken for it, but I think it's fine. I think you could do it. I, yeah. Yeah, maybe if you came with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a date. Okay. All right, maybe next year. After the break, the White House unveiling their executive order on artificial intelligence, now requiring companies to share national security risks with the feds. But up next, why some tech experts are casting doubt on the new standards.
Welcome back on this Halloween night. We were just talking about some of the scariest places uh, here in Maine, the haunted places. But you know what's not scary tonight? The forecast. No, it's looking good. It looks good. It's <laughs> that's good news. Nice. It's dry. Yeah, it's cold out there, but that's no big deal. No snow us. on the ground. Yes. No, at yeah. least along the coastline. You've got to get up in the mountains, and uh, there still is some snow up there. But hey, here's pictures coming to us from Marshall Point Lighthouse along the mid coast, looking good. Yeah, sun setting now. Uh, time to light the jack-o'-lanterns, get things ready to go because it's go time. 43 degrees in Portland, Freiburg's at 43, Sanford at 41, Lewiston Auburn at 41, and the air mass is really dry. Our dew point values are in the 20s, which would imply that tonight our low temperatures are easily going to fall back into the 20s. So even colder than what we did last night. A little bit of cloudiness draped across the mountains, but that's just mid-level stuff and that's no big deal. High pressure here right along the coastline. Now we've got two weather systems we're watching. One associated with a very deep cold pool of air that's dropped into the nation's midsection, but this storm system is going to weaken as it comes eastward. Still, there's some moisture there. This storm system is going to strengthen, but it's going to miss us off to the east. But it also does have some moisture. In fact, look at how close that eastern one is going to be very close at hand, bringing rain or snow to portions of Nova Scotia. And with this moisture so close at hand tomorrow, we're going to see, I think, more in the way of clouds mixing in. And there may be a few flakes of snow in the air. It's not going to amount to anything, not enough, so we have to do a cleanup or anything like that. In fact, more like, hey, is that snow I see? Maybe, yeah. Well, it wouldn't, wouldn't completely surprise me. Overnight low temperatures tonight. Here's where we're back in the teens. I mean, look at Rangeley down to 12 degrees, uh, 19 Bethel, Rumford at 19. And even in the greater Portland area, you're looking at temperatures in the 20s by early tomorrow morning. And high temperatures tomorrow, a couple of degrees cooler than today, only between 40 and 45 degrees. Looking for a little bit of warmth. We'll get back up into the mid 40s on Thursday. Friday, we're back into the 50s. We'll take that into the weekend as well. Mid 50s for Saturday, mid 50s for Sunday. Yes, Sunday is the day. This weekend, we change the clocks and fall back. Scattered clouds tonight, quite chilly with some frost developing. 27 here by morning. Uh, tomorrow, 42. It's a mix of both sun and clouds. There may be a few flakes, but definitely going to be cold again. Here's your eight-day forecast with sunshine for both Thursday and Friday. We're back into the 50s to start the weekend. A chance for showers on Monday and some stormy weather returning by early next week with rain or snow temperatures in the 40s. So looking kind of messy out there early next week, but between now and then looking pretty good. Kathleen, John, yeah, plenty to enjoy. All right, Roger, thank you so much. Now to the newly released wildfire <laughs> body camera footage showing Maui police officers as they move through the town on the day of the deadly Lahaina wildfire. The dramatic footage released by the Maui Police Department as you take a look at this. This is released overnight. It shows officers going door to door trying to get people out saying get out now, even trying to put out fires with garden hoses. You saw officers saving lives. We are sorry for all those who suffered and lost. The cause of this devastating fire is still under investigation, but there is evidence that it could have been sparked by down power lines, which ignited the dry grass. The police chief in Maui says his 13 officers who lived in Lahaina, 11 of them lost everything. A possible deal tonight is on the horizon to end the actor strike. sag after the union representing more than 150,000 actors in major studios, they have made now some significant progress in negotiating sessions. Both sides have reportedly reached tentative understandings on key components of a potential deal. They say an agreement could be reached as early as this week or next week. Actors have been on strike for more than 100 days, pushing back film and television schedules. The use of artificial intelligence has been a sticking point during these negotiations. It was also a concern during the writer's strike, which ended in September. And yesterday, the Biden administration announced a new executive order aimed at keeping AI's power constrained and the technology's developers accountable. President Biden's order requires the federal government to come up with AI safety standards. It mandates companies share their testing results and requires images created by AI to be labeled with watermarks. But there are some doubts among experts about whether this new order will accomplish much. Many times when there are serious issues with AI technologies, many times it is not the companies that discovered it, but consumers.
Other experts say the most effective AI regulations would come from Congress, which has yet to pass any artificial intelligence legislation. Well, tonight, of course, you want to be able to see those trick-or-treaters through some sparkling clean windows. Consumer Reports has tried out several different glass cleaners, in fact. And our Christina Frank has more on which ones work best for windows and all other glass surfaces in your home. Spots, smudges, and grime. The glass surfaces in our home reveal a lot of our not-so-secret messes. And when it comes to cleaning those messes, there are a lot of glass cleaners to choose from. Ammonia-based, ammonium-free. Then there's the homemade vinegar solution, which works best for clear, streak-free glass. Consumer Reports tried out several. I applied toothpaste, oily fingerprints, a mixture of margarine and flour, and bright red lipstick to bathroom mirrors and living room windows. Then I sprayed each one of the different glass cleaners and I counted the number of wipes needed to get rid of the messes. Consumer Reports tests help clear up one big misconception. Vinegar should not be your go-to for glass. It worked in our tests and it removed our messes, but it did leave noticeable amounts of streaks behind, so it just requires a lot more wiping. While ammonia-based cleaners like Windex are known for their cleaning power, the smell isn't so great. Plus, ammonia can leave streaks and film on some types of windows. But not to worry. Consumer Reports found the ammonium-free options cleaned just as well. The winner, this Sprayway Foaming Glass Cleaner. It cut through all of Consumer Reports' messes, leaving surfaces dry after just a single wipe. Plus, it can also be used as a chrome, tile, and porcelain cleaner so you get more bang for your buck. If you're looking for a dedicated glass cleaner, Consumer Reports says this invisible glass is also a great option. But what about cleaning those hard to reach windows or exterior windows? Yes, you can get out the ladder, but Consumer Reports says your safety alone is worth the cost of a telescoping cleaning pole kit available at most home improvement stores. These telescoping kits typically start around $100. Regardless of the method you use, Consumer Reports says wash your windows on a cloudy day. Direct sunlight can actually leave streaks on your windows because the liquid evaporates quickly and leaves residue behind. For Maine's Total Coverage, I'm Christina Frank. A major cleanup milestone reached almost nine months since that toxic train derailment in Ohio. Up next, we'll show you what the site looks like today and what work still needs to happen coming up.
A major milestone in Ohio to tell you about where the last loads of contaminated soil have now been taken out of East Palestine. That is the site of that toxic train derailment back in February. Officials say they've now moved to phase two of the cleanup, so that includes monitoring the air to make sure it's still safe for people to breathe. See New York Corps has more. It's been almost nine months since East Palestine changed forever. Honestly, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. As the city and the people are still recovering, the first round of cleanup nearly completed. More than 170,000 tons of contaminated soil removed from the derailment site. We're uh, finishing up the bulk removal of bulk contaminants out here. All the all the excavation is complete. What you see here in the background is we're hauling off the last of the, the contaminated soils from the site. To date, Norfolk Southern says it has poured more than $96 million into the community since that fateful February night. I can't tell you how to assuage somebody's fears. Um, I've been out here since February 4th. Um, I've been out here on site. I've been in the creeks. I've been in the water. I've been out here on the site, walking up and down the site, in the holes with all these workers out here. Um, the science is what it is. You, you trust the science. The, the, the science says that we're, we're getting it and we've gotten it all. Bob Scoville, Norfolk Southern's manager of environmental operations for the area says now they move into phase two. That means retesting the soil to make sure there are any toxins. Continuing to monitor the air so it's safe to breathe. But some in the community are skeptical. We're here for the long haul. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're not going anywhere. We care about the, the town. Um, we, uh, we're committed to making it right. We're committed to doing the right thing for the town, for the community. So we're, we're not going anywhere. We're going to be here. Norfolk Southern continues to battle multiple lawsuits in the wake of that derailment as well, including lawsuits from the Ohio Attorney General and the U.S. Department of Justice. Total coverage at 6 starts right now. As those trick-or-treaters head out the door, temperatures are falling off rather quickly. We'll look at just how chilly it's going to be by morning. Why was Maine's yellow flag law never utilized with the Lewiston shooter? We ask the Sagadaha County Sheriff. This wasn't a one and done. Uh, there was some follow up in this particular case. One on one with Jared Golden, why the congressman changed his mind on an assault weapons ban and whether he supports any other gun control measures. I feel like I've made the right call for the right reasons here. Uh, perhaps I should have made it sooner. You're watching Channel 8 WMTW. Maine's total coverage starts right now. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us here tonight at 6. I'm John Quisos. And I'm Kathleen Jordan. We have breaking news right now here at the top of the 6. The Attorney General's Office and the Department of Public Safety have released tonight more documents related to the shooting in Lewiston. We are still pouring over those documents we just got a few minutes ago, but we do want to take a look at what we've seen so far. We start here. One person telling Maine State Police that the suspect believed there was a conspiracy against him and that just in time recreation and Schmengis, two of the locations targeted Wednesday night, were broadcasting that he was a pedophile. The suspect also believed that two other businesses in Litchfield and Sabatis were doing the same. The shooter, according to that statement, believed his family was in on that conspiracy as well. Again, just getting these new documents just a few minutes ago. We're going over them right now. We'll have more tonight for you at 10 over on Main CW and tonight here at 11 on Channel 8. And of course, we will have much more coverage as we continue to track the aftermath after those shootings last week as we hear from uh, the loved ones of victims and how the community is moving forward. But here tonight, we do want to talk about your forecast with Chief Meteorologist Roger Griswold. Good evening, Roger. Kathleen, a chilly afternoon turning into what will be a very cold night out there. Portland sky cam showing a little bit of daylight on the western horizon with a band of clouds, but I do expect things to stay dry through the evening hours. It's all about the temperature, though. We're already dropping back into the 30s, and uh, you can see here Jim Keithley getting ready for his next shot. So let's take weather graphics full. 38 degrees in Portland, 37 right now, Lewiston, Auburn, and 40 in Kennebunk. 50 degrees right now gone. That was the thing we're not going to see for the next several days. As far as the satellite radar combined, you can see here we've got clouds out there, but that's those mid-level clouds I talked about. All right, looking ahead to tomorrow, we've got not one, but two areas of low pressure we're tracking. One is some snow shower activity over western portions of New York State. The second one is south of New England, but neither of these are going to have a direct impact on our area. Still, they will provide a bit more in the way of cloudiness around here tomorrow, and there may be a few flakes of snow in the air. 
not accumulating snows, but just a few flakes showing up. So as far as our weather headlines go, we're looking at uh, another cold night ahead with the storm system passing by to our south. That's the one for tomorrow. And then later in the week, warmer temperatures will return. And that's when I expect we will get back up close to 50 degrees. A total look at your forecast. We're talking about the eight day forecast, early thoughts on the weekend. That's all coming up here in just a couple of minutes. John, Kathleen. Okay, Roger, thanks. We'll see you then. Back now to the news and back to Lewiston, a community honoring the victims and also praying for those who were wounded. A growing memorial is outside of just in time bowling alley where seven people lost their lives. Our Jim Keithley is live there tonight. Good evening, Jim. Good evening, Kathleen. A long line of pumpkins you can see there behind me, and the line keeps getting longer. Some have names carved in them, others simply uh, say love or Lewiston Strong. Now, these are uh, their flowers, too, there are crosses. We caught up with Michael Roy. He's a Lewiston native who delivered some pumpkins here today in memory of four of his friends who were killed that night. Trisha Aslin and Tom Conrad here at the bowling alley and Joe Walker and Ronnie Morin at the bar. He said he knew them all. Generous, they were kind. They bring a smile, you know, when they were trying so hard to be, you know, just part of the community and, and, and doing what they love. They loved everybody. You know, um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, and I'm, I'm surprised I'm not tearing up right now. I am, but I'm not crying. I, it's been, it's been really tough. Now, among the wounded, a 16-year-old Lewiston High School student, a pitcher for the baseball team, Gavin Robitaille, was uh, at the bowling alley with his mother and brother. His father and grandfather, incidentally, were at the Schmeckis Bar and Grill, but left before the gunman arrived there. According to a GoFundMe, Gavin was shot in the arm, transported to Mass General, where he is undergoing surgeries to repair a shattered left arm and muscle and nerve damage tonight. Now, people are even showing up here tonight in Halloween costumes to pay their respect and to either bring a pumpkin or light a pumpkin, so it is quite a scene here outside the bowling alley. We're live in Lewiston tonight. Jim Keithley for Maine's Total Coverage. Jim, thank you for that. As the city of Lewiston tries to figure out how to move forward, we're hearing more about the heroic actions of some of the victims. Joe Walker, the manager of Schmengi's, his father says Joe grabbed a knife and ran towards the shooter before he died. John Clavette was supposed to be at the restaurant that night. He says he knew Joe was likely one of the first to take a bullet for someone else. A fight will break out and Joe would just, he'd be in the middle of it in seconds. You know, he was just fearless. Just so I knew after seeing him do things like that, I knew he heard that first gunshot. And I'm sure he just got up straight for it. He was that kind of guy, just protecting everybody. He says he's now brainstorming ways to get support for the victims, families and survivors of these horrific shootings. Students in Lewiston returning to the classroom today. This is part of a three week transition process following those mass shootings in the city there last Wednesday night. Yesterday, only staff returned to the classrooms, but today students were back with a lighter schedule and some time to reflect. The superintendent is overseeing efforts to give teachers the resources they need as they get ready to have difficult conversations. I think it was appropriate for them to have some time to have some mental health professionals who came to visit us to say, here are some things you might hear. Here are some things you need to be thoughtful of. The superintendent says he thinks the next step for the community is to heal together. Students will have early release days tomorrow and Friday. Tonight, aid investigates the sheriff of Sagadaha County defending his agency's handling of concerns about the Lewiston gunman. Newly released documents show family and Army Reserve leadership feared he was, quote, going to snap weeks before that shooting. Terry Stackhouse sat down with him to ask why more wasn't done. Sagadaha County Sheriff Joel Mary reiterating what he said last night that he believes his office acted appropriately uh, in handling complaints that were brought to their attention about the eventual Lewiston shooter who killed 18 people. He did confirm, however, that no action was taken in terms of initiating the process for Maine's yellow flag law to remove his weapons. People wonder, well, why didn't you force that contact? Why didn't you look at him? You know, um, there, there are certain rights. In May, the shooter's family called concern, saying that he picked up 10 to 15 guns stored at a relative's home. And then in September, records show the Army Reserve raised concerns over psychotic episodes. Deputies went to his home for wellness checks twice, but never saw him. 
His office issued a file six attempt to locate with other agencies. We looked at uh, what was uh, done as it aligns with our policy. Uh, and I, I can say that we did f follow, w worked within the, um, um, our policy. Um, Does policy need to change now? I think we need to look at it. I think we need to, to say, um, is there other, um, other ways to approach these situations? Sheriff Mary says his office has already launched an internal review examining how they responded to complaints about the eventual Lewiston shooter. In Bath, Terry Stackhouse, Maine's Total Coverage. Also new tonight, we have an exclusive interview with Maine Congressman Jared Golden. We wanted to speak with him after his surprise announcement last week that he now supports a ban on assault weapons, the kind of semi-automatic rifles that were used in the mass shootings in Lewiston last week, his hometown in his district. Our Phil Hirschkorn sat down with Golden today. I began by asking Congressman Golden if it took a mass shooting in his hometown to change his view to support an assault weapons ban. Sadly, I guess the answer to that question is yes, that's exactly what it took for me personally. I feel like I've made the right call for the right reasons here. Uh, perhaps I should have made it sooner. Golden telling me his reversal came together in his mind on his trip home from Washington after the mass shooting. The bowling alley attacked just a half mile from the home he shares with his pregnant wife and their two-year-old daughter. While I may, you know, have kept one in the home, am I going to start walking around everywhere with it? You know, are we going to go to the grocery store with AR-15 slung on our shoulders, all of us, who have obviously good reason to be concerned about safety in our communities? Is that the world that I want for my daughter's future? The answer there is no. But when it comes to other gun control measures, Golden isn't budging. He remains a firm no against banning high capacity magazines that allow a shooter to fire more rounds before reloading and against expanding background checks to buyers at gun shows or from private gun sellers. I'm not changing any of my beliefs in regards to the importance of the rights of people to own firearms. The intent of uh, those who wrote the Constitution was to, um, you know, try and ensure that a government could not disarm a population. Um, and also to ensure that uh, citizenry and communities are able to provide for common self-defense. He also opposes a national red or yellow flag law for law enforcement to confiscate guns from people deemed a danger to themselves or others. You know, when you talk about things like red flag laws or yellow flag laws, I think that those are, are best uh, put in place at the state level and implemented locally, of course. But in a district scarred by tragedy and historic deep support for Second Amendment rights, Golden says he's not worried about paying a political price for wanting a laser-like focus to ban semi-automatic rifles. I believe really strongly that sometimes uh, things happen or things are put before you uh, as a political leader. Uh, where you just have to look past any concern or consideration uh, of re-election. Golden, who plans to seek a fourth term next year, told me when he's done representing Mainers in Washington, he wants to feel good about it, that he did it right. As for seeking to ban assault weapons, he said, there's no looking back, I can only look ahead. In Lewiston, Phil Hirschkorn, Maine's Total Coverage. Other news now here tonight at 6 as state leaders are remembering a lawmaker and longtime activist for women's rights. Friends and colleagues say Representative Lois Gay -Gal, uh, Galgay Racket of South Portland was a remarkable person whose legacy leaves behind one of leadership. Governor Janet Mills expressing her condolences today, saying Racket was a dear friend. Racket was the executive director of the Family Crisis Services in Cumberland County before coming becoming a legislator. She recently sponsored a bill. Mill signed into law decriminalizing prostitution in Maine. Coming up, families in Lewiston are looking for a bit of normalcy tonight. Two events are providing safe trick or treating events for kids. And Mainers looking for more affordable health insurance coverage will have an opportunity to enroll tomorrow. We'll give you the details about this popular program coming up here tonight. And the cold temperatures doing very little to melt any of the snow. That's a live webcam picture coming to us from Sugarloaf. You can still see the snow covering the ground. No snow guns running yet, but it probably won't be long. Total look at the forecast right after the break. Stay with us.
weather at your school here at Kenny Bunk Elementary, hanging out with the first graders. What do you guys want to say to everybody? Happy <laughs> They are excited for a great night uh, trick-or-treating as families are getting ready for that. And it's good to know the weather is cooperating, too. Yeah, it's happening right now. I can, oh. I can hear it out yes. there right now, <laughs> digging out the costumes, making oh, sure yeah. everything. And, uh, and the doorbells. Those are ringing right now, we have to imagine. Interrupting the weather yes. cast. Oh, yeah. Another one at the door, <laughs> another one at the door. So let's get right to it. Portland Skycam showing just a little glimmer of light on the western horizon. And, uh, you know, we've got the darkness overspreading. Be safe out there if you're going to be out and about. No problems with any kind of rain expected. 38 degrees, that's it. The cold is still in place. The wind right now out of the south southwest at 6 miles per hour. The dew point at 27. And I always love that dew point because it's a quick and easy way of saying, all right, how cold are we going to get tonight? You could just look at the dew point and you'd probably be pretty close as long as there aren't any other factors going on. And that's kind of where we're at tonight. Most areas are going to be back in the 20s. Freiburg right now it's 40 degrees looking at 30s Augusta and Lewiston Auburn as well. So here's what's happening. We had a little bit of cloudiness up in the mountains, but even there it's going to thin out high pressure dominating our weather. Two weather systems we're watching one associated with a big pool of cold air that's dropped into the nation's midsection near record cold all the way down into Texas just unheard of for this time of the year. This storm system is going to weaken as it comes east. This storm system is going to strengthen as it moves off to our east. So we're sort of in between the two, but each of them is going to provide a little bit of moisture and it's going to be a close call. There's your ocean storm system, very close at hand. Here's snow shower activity coming out of the west and with a handful of clouds. So tomorrow turns out to be a